Have you ever heard of the time that a cult of Christian warrior nuns ruled Europe? In the early 1000s, the dissatisfaction with feudal rulers caused such an uproar that large swaths of land fell under the rule of these nuns, whose devotion was to God and the people rather than their dynasties. Okay, that never really happened, but I did make it happen in Crusader Kings 3, and here's a short alternate history of how a small Catholic cult turned into the most powerful Christian faction in Europe, changing the course of history forever. It all started with Countess Adelgisa of Genoa. A young countess in 800s Italy, she claimed to experience visions of God and with the education afforded to a young noble, began writing them down. She was most troubled by what she saw as the great personal ambitions of feudal rulers who put their dynasties and personal gains over the good of those they'd ruled over. Instead, she saw devotion to God rather than dynastic power as the ultimate way to ensure benevolent rule. Very quickly she became popular with the people, who believed she was divinely led, and the Pope, seeking to use this momentum to curry popular favor, gave his official blessing to her efforts. While her ideas were of course controversial with her fellow nobility, she also served in the courts of the Italian crown, showing that the kings she served under supported her or at the very least tolerated her efforts. Her following grew and eventually through pleas to the pope to save her neighboring peasants and totally not through wars, she was granted rights to manage more and more land. In the name of God, of course. She dedicated the rest of her life to rooting out evil wherever she saw it, deposing ineffective and selfish counts, as well as pursuing heretics. Through her treatises and attestations, a small cult grew around her, perhaps even without her direct encouragement, forming what one could call a Catholic offshoot of fervent believers, or Ferventines. In her devotion to God, she embraced celibacy, another belief which would later become a core tenet of the following she'd acquired. In addition, rather than passing her rule down to her family, she believed stewardship over the realm should be passed down to a pupil taught directly in the teachings and revelations she believed she saw directly from Christ. After a series of constant internal Italian struggles, Adelgisa refused to pledge her fealty to the new Italian king, retreating to Sardinia and ruling from there. Instead, she pledged directly to God, in essence becoming an independent ruler, although always swearing fealty to the Pope. She died on October 3rd, 941, being succeeded by her ward Ingeltrude, who would later go by the name Benedicta. Benedicta was notable for writing a treatise on her predecessor's Ferventine practices and drafted a theory on how to best live one's life to follow those beliefs, including dress, speech, and more. Those following these teachings came from all walks of life, and although they originated from disparate cultures, eventually they came to live in ways more similar to each other than others, in what could be described as a sort of Ferventine, or sometimes called Adelgisen culture. One of the more notable beliefs of this culture was that women too could fight for God, something that would over the course of the coming centuries give rise to a rank of zealous warrior women. The majority of Benedicta's rule was inwardly focused, building infrastructure and new temples in cities across the realm. She was known for meddling with Italy's politics in an attempt to stabilize the constantly feuding families to no avail, and eventually for liberating, or conquering, Majorca from its previous non-faithful rulers. She was a very shrewd politician, and had a long-standing alliance with the Byzantine Emperor, which kept her relatively small realm safe from foreign invasions. Also, while Benedicta did not describe experiencing visions in her young age like her predecessor, at the age of 75 she claimed to receive a vision to conquer and liberate the nearby Algier from its Ibadi and Zaidi rulers and bring its citizens into the flock. This resulted in the Great Algerian Revocation of 996, where all local rulers were ousted and replaced with Ferventine stewards. By the year 1000, there were no non-Christian rulers in the region. Around this time, the term Ferventine Protectorate is also first recorded. Following a controversial revelation that her chosen successor had relations out of wedlock, Benedicta could not allow such a scandal, so she quickly found a new successor, a young ward she could shape and control more directly. The final expansion of Benedicta's rule followed in 1001, when word of a terrible kinslayer tyrannically ruling Sicily reached her. She sent a missive to the Pope, and declared her intent to cleanse Sicily of sin. 
By the year 1003, the territory was firmly under her management. Benedicta ended her 64-year reign on December 8, 1005, at the age of 85, succeeded by her chosen successor, Carita. At the time of her ascension to the throne, she was studying at an academy in Rome, learning the art of diplomacy. Through her position, she eventually befriended the Pope Marinus II himself, whom she was even reported to be seen exercising with, although that information is disputed. In the year 1010, conducting a pilgrimage to Canterbury, she solidified an alliance with England, one of the most powerful players in Europe outside of the Holy Roman Empire. The Iberian struggle finally spilled towards the Protectorate, in a massive attempt by the Islamic side to reclaim the Balearic Islands, which Carita, with the force of her new alliances, rebuffed with ease. In 1014, she officially moved the administrative capital of the Protectorate to Cagliari in Sardinia to further emphasize the Protectorate's control over the Mediterranean. A poem attested to around this time was attributed to the Pope himself. When the red plume to war comes to her lands, all flashes of iron and shouted demands, her subjects prove grateful, for if they are not, the next to their door is her sword brought. Eventually, the administration of even more territories fell under her stewardship. In 1045, she liberated Crete from its Muwaladi rulers, adding it to the land managed by the Protectorate. In 1051, she turned her attention to North Africa, banishing the Ashari leaders from the region. Much like her predecessor, in the span of a year she removed all local Ashari leaders from power and replaced them with Ferventine sisters, venerable women without families who dedicate their life to the management of a single county. Upon one's death, the current regent would simply reassign another sister to the region. In 1063, after taking over the management of Malta from the constant barrage of strife, civil wars and succession disputes that is the Byzantine Empire, the Protectorate received a special charter from the Pope Anastasius III the Gracious, tasking them with the protection of the Mediterranean in the interest of Christianity, giving them legal power to claim any coastland along the entire sea. Having been granted this mandate, Carita immediately expanded territories towards Gibraltar, capturing Tlemcen and Rif. She died on March 19, 1069. Her efforts in securing the Mediterranean for Christianity would surely be remembered for generations. She was succeeded by Dorothea. Dorothea's most notable achievement was her conquest of Iberia. She declared her first war in 1082, followed by a series of incursions claiming more and more territory, and by 1097, all Muslim rulers were expelled from the region. What wasn't held by the Protectorate was in the hands of other rulers who also followed the Ferventine teachings. This was followed by further expansion into North Africa, and by 1111, the Mediterranean western North African coast was under Ferventine stewardship. This period of warfare, combined with the predominantly female leadership of the Ferventine Sisterhood, brought forward a tradition of warrior nuns, which would become recognizable and feared on the battlefield in the centuries to come. Dorothea continued her North African expansion in 1124, the same year she had excluded her original heir from succession due to her bearing a child out of wedlock. At this point, although not enforced, strict chastity was expected of the future heir to the Ferventine throne. Her North African campaign resulted in significant gains in 1126, 27, and 28. Finally, she turned to the Canaries, which were claimed in 1129. After a brief period of peace, she set her sights on the Byzantine Empire to liberate the south of Italy which had been under their rule for years. This would finally bring the entirety of Italy under the Catholic Pope's religious guidance. Dorothea died in September of 1141, forever remembered for greatly expanding the territories under Ferventine guidance, pushing further into North Africa and Iberia. Her successor Elegisa was raised as somewhat of a child prodigy. Not only was she intelligent beyond her years, but like Adelgisa, she also received visions which she claimed were from God. In these visions, she saw the return of the cross to the Holy Land of Jerusalem. Her rule was mostly a period of stabilization, although in 1174 she did lead a successful campaign in Egypt, ousting the leaders there and replacing them with theocratic Ferventine rule. This process was really labor-intensive and I'll tell you about it later. 
For a quick detour, in the 1170s it became apparent that a very effective English Adelgisen movement became prominent across England. For about 150 years, since Catata's close relationship with England, Adelgisen Ferventine beliefs had been taking roots in England, culminating in what's considered the Anglo-Adelgisen culture. Interestingly, at this time, England and Italy were ruled by a single ruler, Queen Margarita III, who claimed to be a descendant of Adelgisa herself. After her death, England would be thrust into internal struggles in the 1180s, resulting in its fracturing in the next decades. Back to the Protectorate, in 1178, in response to the growth of the Ferventine Protectorate, the Pope Gregorius V bestowed upon it some rights previously reserved only to the Holy Roman Empire, essentially elevating the Protectorate to imperial status. That same year, Elagisa advanced her claims on Iberia, unifying the peninsula once and for all. Somehow this didn't count for ending the struggle. In 1196, the time had come to march onto the Holy Land, and Elagisa successfully led the war to reconquer Jerusalem. Elagisa died on the 1st of June 1208 AD, leaving a legacy of relatively peaceful rule and the return of Jerusalem to Christian hands. She left the management of the realm to her ward, the future Empress Ferventa. Ferventa's rule is noted perhaps by having the biggest impact on Europe of all Ferventine leaders. While the others expanded to North Africa and Iberia, Ferventa was the first to confront the dominant force in Europe, the Holy Roman Empire. But why would she disrupt another Catholic force? Throughout the decades, as the Ferventine lands grew into a proper empire, tensions between the Protectorate and the other Catholic rulers kept increasing as fewer and fewer rulers could stand up to the high and specific standards set by the Ferventines. Affairs, out-of-wedlock children, kin-slaying, scheming, all were condemned by the Ferventines, and accusations of the Holy Roman Empire being false in its holiness came to a head in the 1220s and in the following decades, a series of wars would follow. In September 1225, Ferventa declared war on the Holy Roman Empire, declaring it corrupt, seeking to claim and liberate as many lands from their rule as possible. She claimed Aquitaine and Burgundy in 1228, and only 11 years later she declared the second Ferventine HRE war, this time claiming even more territory. At this time, while the Christians were consumed by infighting, to the east a new threat had arisen, unnoticed by the Ferventines, but not by the Holy Roman Empire, the Mongols. Would they spell the end for Ferventine expansion? As Mongolia continues to expand westwards, instead of reinforcing their eastern position, the Holy Roman Empire loses its grasp over several territories in the Mongol warpath while facing Ferventine forces in the west. The third and final war between the Ferventine Protectorate and the Holy Roman Empire began in 1261 and saw the fall of Germany and adjacent territories to the Ferventines by just the following year. Within two more years, the remaining Holy Roman Empire fractured and ceased to exist. Ferventa died in 1265 and was succeeded by her ward, Galatea. Immediately upon taking over the realm, Galatea had to put down a massive rebellion in the former Holy Roman lands, a revolt which took two years to put down. In 1276, she successfully claimed large parts of Bavaria, and in 1280, she claimed the last remnants of the North African coast that were not under Ferventine protection. By 1284, the final threat from the east, the Golden Mongol Horde, had dissolved. All five holy sites of Christianity were in Catholic or Ferventine hands, and Galatea recreates the Holy Roman Empire as a theocracy. The Ferventine mission was a success. Europe is purified of sin. I hope you liked this story. I certainly had fun making it. I got the original idea while playing as Ireland, and I noticed that despite being insular, the Pope was still our head of faith. So I noticed the right tenet, and I was like, hmm. So I wanted to make a faith that was basically a cult of Catholic nuns, but still following the Pope, and I wanted them to be based out of Sardinia. And that was kind of the original outline. 
Originally, the plan was to do the Secure the Mediterranean decision, but that ended up being kind of easy, so the next part was to get the Holy Roman Empire. But the HRE ended up forming really early and got really strong early on, so I was kind of in a standoff for a while, until we were so strong we could just blob around, which is also why this playthrough ended in the 1200s and not in the end date. It just ended up being too blobby for me. I was kind of hoping the Mongols would reach us and then we could end on an inconclusive were the Mongols the reason the warrior nuns stopped being a thing kind of thing. But then they flopped before reaching us, so that also couldn't happen. I also decided early on that I'd make everything a theocratic title, but I couldn't do it for a while because I didn't figure out the workaround for some of the game mechanics. In Christian faiths, all your bishop titles are actually owned by your archbishop and you can't grant them a title. But sometimes when you claim titles from Muslims, you might get a temple for yourself. As long as you don't press play after winning the war, it'll be assigned to you. Then you can grant that title to a new leader and then grant that person a county. Voila! Theocratic county. Works even for ones that don't even have temples. Then there's a second workaround you can use if you make your clerical appointments revocable, which luckily I had done. For that part, you just need to select your archbishop, dismiss them, and then grant them a territory. These might get fixed later on, but I was very happy to make use of them now. It did, however, take upwards of 15 minutes sometimes after capturing new territory to make it all theocratic. A few characters in, I also decided I wouldn't get married anymore to add a bit of difficulty setting up alliances. But with the adoption mechanic, it actually means you can just adopt an infinite number of kids and marry them off for alliances, so that wasn't really much of a challenge. The adoption did make it really possible to play a non-dynastic dynasty though, so that was nice. One thing that was a bit sad was just how much Catholicism was treated as a different religion when it came to certain things. If the Pope is your head of faith, surely you're invited in on the Crusades, right? If I were to replay this again or set it up as a challenge for someone, I would limit it to no marriage, one adopted heir at any given time, theocratic vassals only. If you expand and get non-theocratic vassals, you have to somehow revoke that title and make it theocratic. Let me know if you give that a try. Maybe we get a Byzantine theocracy. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope that you liked this video. It's been on my mind for a while and it's a bit different from my usual Let's Plays, but let me know if you liked it. I'd love to make more stuff like this in the future. As you can imagine, it takes a lot longer to make than my Let's Plays, so I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a like and told me what you thought about it in the comments. Special thanks to Quendersoff, who makes awesome and informative Paradox-related videos for being the voice of the Pope. A link to his channel is in the description. If you enjoyed this video, I have a recommendation for you. It's my Odd Realm Tales video, which tells the story of my very first Odd Realm settlement. Odd Realm is a bit like Dwarf Fortress, if you're familiar with that. And if you'd like to say hi live, you can also head over to my Twitch at twitch.tv slash lelling, where you can also support me with real life tips. Otherwise, you can check out my Let's Plays and subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this.